Okay, so uh, if I can hit here, mute all, boom. I have, uh, I've got this presentation put together for you to talk to you about the psychology and the power of the reverse appointment. Um, I've got a slide deck kind of built for this as well, so I'm gonna try to use that uh, slide deck as part of the presentation and hopefully that whole thing works. You know, it is technology and technology does uh, get goofy, but this has worked in the past, so I hope and with confidence uh, it'll work for everybody here today. I also encourage you, if you have a pad and paper to take some notes, I'm gonna want you to feel free to do so. If you're not currently using your, your smartphone to watch this stream, if you're using a computer or a laptop station, and you have your smartphone available, there will be a couple of times where you may wanna actually take a picture of the screen. And so at, at any time, feel free to do that and uh, we'll get going. All right, so let's get started here with the power of the psychology of the reverse appointment. Now, some of you do not know who I am. I will not spend a lot of time on that right now because I wanna get into the meat of what we're gonna do. But uh, just for a simple introduction, my name is Jonathan Dawson. I'm the founder of a company called Cellcology and uh, we teach the psychology behind the sales. We're an automotive only, uh, dealership uh, uh, vendor so we work directly with dealerships and that's all we do is try to find ways to make your world a little bit better place and make your team a little bit more effective um, so I am going to get started here all right let me uh, pull up this share screen here and hopefully this little uh, bad boy here will work so what's what the, is the goal yeah perfect what is the goal so the goal then of a typical lead handle a lean handling process is of course like I said uh, try to get the customer to commit to a time to come in um, you know that's that's something that every internet department every BBC agent every person on sales who's trying to set appointments it's all get the customer to set an appointment get the customer set an appointment and when you when you work from a premise like that when you work from a, a purpose of of you know uh, try to set appointments I think you're missing uh, the point here, and I think you're missing the opportunity that could be created from a reverse appointment perspective. So what the end in mind in for me then is, is not how do I get my team to set more appointments, it's how do I create an environment, experience, and a process where the customer wants to set an appointment with us. That's the real question that I wanna ask, a slightly different approach to, to solving the problem. So what is the psychology of an appointment? What is the psychology of a reverse appointment? Well, this is the whole thing we're gonna be talking about for the next few minutes here, is the idea of why do people even keep appointments if they set them, and why would a customer even wanna come into your dealership at all? So what we're gonna look at is this idea of an appointment initiated by or desired by the actual customer themselves. And in order to do that, I have a very simple, big, bold promise that I wanna make you. I'm gonna promise you this, if you'll listen, if you'll take some notes, if you'll um, take some, uh, you know, pictures of the screen. If you'll talk to your team about this, it will radically transform the amount of appointments that you set and the quality of those appointments, reducing the overall activity workflow that your BDC agents have to do and increasing the appointment show ratio um, where the customer actually keeps the appointment and comes in. So if you will do what I'm gonna show you, it will absolutely transform that because it's based on consumer psychology. So what we want to start with is ask the question, you know, what causes a reverse appointment to begin with? You know, what's actually causing that customer to, to keep the appointment, to come in and to show up at the dealership at all? Well, I think what causes that uh, is a series of, of, uh, of triggers that happen in the consumer psychology side. So what, what the consumer is thinking about and what they're feeling as they're being responded to and as the communication is happening. So what I want to do then is, is ask the question, I mean, I keep, uh, I have new people trying to join. I'm just adding them real quick. What I want to do is ask the question, how do we do that? And so specifically, we're going to look at five steps of a first impression that I want to show you in the way that you respond to your leads. I want to take a look at the four principles of urgency. This is the psychology part behind it. I want to take a look at three rules for follow-up that your team should implement for how they follow up. Two options we all have, and then the one main mission that I'm on. So this is what we're gonna be exploring. Let's start with the five steps of a first impression and, uh, and how the psychology of a response that a customer gets affects their way of responding back to your team. So, so right now, like at your store, there's a lot of times we talk about these two major things. We talk about uh, appointment set, appointment show, we talk about that, and we talk about response time. And I'm gonna flip the script on both of those and ask instead of, 
how many appointments do we set by itself? We want to ask the question, how do we create a process where the customer wants to set an appointment with us? And instead of just looking at response time, how quickly did we respond to the client's lead? I want to look at response time from the customer side. How quickly does the customer respond to us? Because you can be the quickest on the block as far as response time for a lead that comes in. But if your customer doesn't respond to your emails and your voicemails and your attempts to connect, if the customer's not responding to you, then all you have is this massive workflow for your team of a bunch of tedious tasks that they end up becoming discouraged by. So let's take a look at these five steps of a first impression. Uh, in, in, a, in a snapshot, what they are is pattern recognition, pattern interruption, proactivity, permission, and then the possibilities. Your first response to a lead, and I'm talking for now, let's say an e-lead that comes in, you're replying to an e-lead from AutoTrader, CarGurus, TrueCar, doesn't matter. The lead comes in, your first response should have these five component steps to it. So what does that mean when we look at things like uh, pattern recognition? What is that, what are we talking about here? Specifically, when we talk about the idea of pattern recognition, uh, we're talking about the idea of, of recognizing the source of the lead itself, where is it coming from, um, and, uh, and what is the lead type itself. So when we look at pattern recognition first, we're looking at the source, what kind of lead is it, the type, is it a used car, new car lead, is it a credit lead, what type of lead is it, and what, what is the source or origination of the lead? Um, did it come from TrueCar, did it come from CarGurus, did it come from AutoTrader, where did it come from? The other thing we look for in the pattern recognition is we look at things like, uh, do we have any contact information the customer gave us? What's their email type? Um, is there a possibility we could do a social search on this customer to see who the customer is by searching their, um, their social profile? Could we even Google, for example, if it's a business email, could we Google the business or the business email and find out something about the lead from the Google search? What is the temperament or openness that we seem to get from this lead? So the very first thing that we need to teach our people to do is when a lead comes in is say, okay, um, how do we first ask the question, what can we guess or what can we intuit about this lead by just looking at the clues that come from the lead itself? Because every lead type and every source and every email address and everything the customer does send over is a clue or a pattern and pattern recognition is our first step in the process. Now, once we have pattern recognition, once we've looked at the picture of the lead, for example, um, a lead that comes in that has basically no information in it, like the customer doesn't give us any valid information, uh, is different as a lead than a customer that gives us all this information and writes a biography in the comment section. A customer that gives us a uh, home number, cell phone number, two email addresses, and a physical home address, a lead that comes in like that is a completely different kind of lead than a lead that comes in with what seems to be fake phone numbers, fake names, and maybe a made up email address for just shopping for a car. The point is all of that information gives us the psychology behind the lead, which is the first thing that we need. Now, once we have the psychology behind the lead, then we go to the next step in the process. So the next step is pattern interruption. Once I recognize the pattern of the customer, I need to now get their attention so that they'll engage with me in correspondence, which means the first thing I send them has to get their attention. The first voicemail I leave has to make them want to call me back. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at how do I interrupt someone's pattern of thought? So for example, in an e-lead, if we're talking about, again, the, the inbound lead that comes from some sort of third party, what we want to ask ourselves is how can we create a source-based opener or even an email-based opener, a negative opener or a personalized opener? Let me break it down for you. A source-based opener is where we recognize and acknowledge the source of the lead in our first response. So let's say, for example, it is a true car lead. In the subject line, I would want to put something like, if I'm using source-based responses, I would use something like, um, your true car lead has been um, uh, accepted, or your true car lead uh, needs more information. And put that as the subject line. By using true car in the subject line, since that's the source that they sent the lead through, I'm using that as a pattern interruption to get them to go, oh, this is exactly the thing that I submitted through. If I use email-based openers, I'm referencing something in their personal email, which I'll show you examples of this just in a moment, but 
Let me give you a perfect example that, that, uh, that illustrates it. When teaching a sales team how to do this, I was asking them to give me kind of their unresponsive dead leads from the last you know, week to two weeks. And as I took these leads um, from them and we kind of opened up the, the CRM and started responding, um, I said, look at the clues that you can have from an email address. For example, an email address has the part that goes before the at symbol, that's the part the customer chooses, and then you have the part right after the at symbol, which is the server provider that they're using, whether that's a, a company server, so it's a work email, or whether that's a, a server like a Gmail. Now, what that tells you about the customer is important because an AOL address is different than a Gmail address. A Hotmail or a Netscape address is different than a Gmail address or an abcconstruction.com address. What I'm looking for is the, the, the clue that something like a AOL.com email tells me. And I'm not gonna find a 23 year old with an AOL email address ever. Right? I'm not going to find a Netscape dot, you know, net um, on a 23 year old's account. It doesn't exist. Even a Hotmail. You can actually, you can actually categorize by the by the, the the type of email that they use. You can actually put them into categories of likelihood uh, based on the pattern. Also, for example, when they when they choose their email address. So I had a I had an email that came in and it was fuzzy slippers 67 at uh, I think it was like Hotmail or Yahoo.com. Okay, Fuzzy Slipper 67 at, at, at Yahoo.com. Well, what does that tell you about the person who submits a lead whose email address is Fuzzy Slipper 67, right? That tells you something about the person. In fact, if everyone watching this right now, if you were all to just guess right now, the gender, right? Who is this person, Fuzzy Slipper 67? Is it a man or a woman, right? You're gonna, I imagine all of you would say it's a woman. You're, you, you'd be right, that's exactly what it was. If I said uh, Fuzzy Slipper 67, if you had to guess what the 67 stands for, what would you guess? You'd say 67 could be the year that they were born. It could be the year that they graduated. Uh, it, it could be that. And so you'd say maybe, maybe the fact that it's a Yahoo email address makes the person uh, has to be probably likely over the age of 30. So these are all clues that you start looking for. So in the case of this particular lead, I responded in the subject line, I typed in, I love fuzzy slippers too. That was my subject line. So that's a pattern interruption because the person receiving the email does not expect to get an email that says, I love fuzzy slippers too. In the first opening sentence um, of the email body, I wrote, I couldn't help but notice that your email address was fuzzy slippers at yahoo.com. And I thought to myself, you seem like a very fun and bubbly personality type to have an email address like that. Uh, I love fuzzy slippers too, and I would love to talk to you. That was the email. The response came immediately from the person with an LOL, and I can't believe uh, that you noticed that, uh, and it's always great to meet somebody who likes fuzzy slippers too. But the customer immediately responded because we were able to interrupt their pattern using an email-based opener. Negative openers are where you say something negative in your subject line or in your first sentence, or if you do it in both. A negative would be something like, we want to apologize, it seems like we've made a mistake. Or um, your, lead, uh, your lead has errors in it, and, uh, and so um, please reply. That's a negative opener because the customer's brain sees that and goes, what's wrong? What do you mean? Or if you say something like, um, we want to apologize, we've made a terrible mistake. If you see that in your subject line, in your email inbox, you're going to read that and you're going to go, whoa, what just happened? Who made a mistake? The point is a negative opener is a way of getting people's attentions. And just like the personalized openers as well, when you personalize something, for example, let's say you notice the city the lead came from, or you, you have um, a family member, for example, who has the same name as the lead. I'm not asking you to make things up, I'm asking you to connect and find a way to connect with people. But if somebody sends in a lead and their name is the same name as my mother, and I put in the subject line, my mother shares the same name as you, I hope you're as nice as my mom, if you put that in the subject line, people will see that and that's a straight up pattern interruption. They don't anticipate getting an email like that from a, from a car dealer. So that's what pattern interruption is all about. And I'll show you examples of this in a second, but I'm just trying to get you to realize that this is the way you have to think. Uh, if we look at the next one, which is proactivity, this is the third step of making a first impression. In the third step, we're gonna look at proactivity, which is to anticipate their fears, to anticipate their goals, to anticipate their questions or anticipate their objections. 
What I'm referring to here is the idea that every lead that submits to you, especially today with the COVID going on, when people submit an inquiry, in the back of their mind, they have fears, they have goals, they have questions, or they have objections. If you don't learn how to proactively initiate those, bring them up and, and, and bring them to the forefront, if you don't know how to do that, you're going to have to overcome them later and create a conflict. So uh, I was doing a live stream for, my, for, for a few of my uh, clients earlier today, and one of the salespeople had asked me, he said, John, we're responding to leads from a couple weeks ago, and the customer keeps responding back and saying, with everything going on, we just want to hold off and wait. And I said back to the sales team today, I said, you know, the problem you have is you're not being proactive. You're letting the customer set the terms of engagement. You're letting the customer say that they're not ready to do anything yet. And then you have to then try to convince them that they're wrong. And that's a bad place to sell from where you're trying to convince people that they're in a wrong place. So instead, what you want to do is you want to start with initiating that thing which they're thinking proactively to bring it up for the client. And if you bring it up for the client, you take away the fear of the client by saying it first. So what I gave the salespeople to do is I said, I want you to, from now on, when you're calling that customer back and they pick up the phone, I want you to say to the customer first, before you let them say anything, I want you to say something like, hey, Peter, this is John at the dealership. With everything going on in the world right now, I've been calling a lot of my customers who had sent in a lead inquiry a week or two ago, and I'm talking to them about their options because some people are wanting to hold off and see how everything pans out, while some people are still thinking about getting a car. I just wanted to check where you're at. Now you've initiated for the client. You're the one who said, right now with everything going on, some people are wanting to wait while some people are still wanting to move forward. I just wanted to check and see where you're at. Because you said it first, the customer can't use it against you. The only thing they can do is agree with what you've just said. All they, all they have the ability to do is to, is to say, yes, that's where I'm at. Yes, I, I was, uh, we're, we're, we're going to be holding off, which is perfect because you're the one who initiated it. You still own it. So let me show you what you do with it. It's really simple. If I say, hey, Peter, I'm just checking in with you because uh, I know you sent in a lead a couple of weeks back and I've been calling on some clients who did so. And some of the people I'm talking to are wanting to hold off and wait until kind of see everything, how everything pans out, while others are still looking to do something um, um, and get a car. I just wanted to check in with you and see kind of where you're at. And Pete says, you know what, John, I appreciate you calling, but yeah, we're just at a place right now with everything going on that we, we do, we're just want to want to hold off, um, but we appreciate you calling. I say back, you know what, I appreciate that too. Like I said, I've heard that from several of the people I talk, I talk to. The reason I'm calling though is because for those people who do not have to wait, for those that do not have to wait, they're able to take advantage of the current incentives and take advantage of the current inventory and take advantage of the current situation and leverage it to get the best possible deal on the best options in inventory. Because those that have to wait will miss out on the initial incentives. And when they do shop for a car, all the prime inventory will be taken already and they'll be stuck with the green and yellow cars. And so I just wanted to check with you because if you don't have to wait, I wanted to make sure that you got to, to take advantage of the programs. Do you have to wait or would you like to know about some of the programs? Now I can frame that back to you and give you good reasons to take action. But you see, because I'm the one who brought it up, it's not me trying to convince you that you're wrong. I'm the one who initiated it by saying, I'm calling some people right now and some of them are sharing with me that they want to wait, hold off, and see how things pan out, while others are still looking to take some, uh, uh, um, action and, and get a vehicle, just checking in. Proactivity prevents future problems. You need to learn and teach your people how to be proactive instead of reactive and overcoming all the objections. They need to learn to introduce them. And that's what proactivity is about. Let me show you some more. In step four, it's about permission. Permission is when you, in your response, you ask for permission to help the client and you ask for permission to give the customer an opportunity to, to, to serve, uh, be served by you. So permission is the next step in this approach. I start with recognizing what patterns are available to me from the lead, what type of lead is it, what type of inquiry. Then I go, okay, how do I interrupt their pattern by, by maybe saying or doing something they don't expect? How do I proactively initiate what they're thinking so that they don't have to give me objections? And then how do I gain permission to do my job? 
and present to them op opportunities. So when it comes to permission, the permission is really to, to, to say, hey, I wanted to see if I could help you with some pricing or some options or some information or help you through the process. As I just said in the example I gave, if I say to you, you know, hey, I'm calling because some customers are wanting to hold off and wait a little bit and want to see how things are panning out while others are uh, looking to, to still take action, want to see and check in, kind of see where you're at. Oh, hey, look, we're, we're wanting to wait. I say, absolutely, I understand. That's why I'm calling actually. Because if, uh, if you don't have to wait, here's the right time and the reason why it is the right time. And if it's okay with you, I wanted to share with you some of the programs, incentives, and options that are currently available uh, so you can take advantage of that. I'm asking for permission to give them an opportunity. And that's the step that allows people to take that next step with you. If you ask for permission to help people, it's very hard for people to say, no, I don't want you to try to help me. So that's why permission as a, as a, a step in the process is so important. And now the next and final step I'm gonna show you is to, is to go over possibilities. And this is simply where you just delineate and explain to the client what are the actual options and what is it you actually can do for them. And so possibilities, of course, include uh, offering alternative vehicles to them, alternative financing, alternative process, alternative information. Alternative process today is, of course, an at-home delivery or a curbside delivery, doing all the documentation over, over the phone and online and not having to come in. These are the steps that you have to use today uh, to create a customer that's willing to open up and take action. So these are the five uh, uh, steps that I've been showing you. Now, what I wanna do is show you what it looks like in real time. So this is actually an, uh, an actual lead that I wanna walk through that, that we use this approach with while I was at a store and I uh, took a dead lead and said, hey, let me, let me show you how this works. So here's the actual lead that we were working with. And if I can real quick, I just want, uh, Pete, if you can unmute yourself uh, for a second and just tell me, make sure that you're able to see everything I'm showing you right now. Yeah, I see the step one pattern recognition screen. Perfect. Yep. Just making sure everybody can still see. Good. So what we're looking at here is this is the actual lead, lead itself that came in. So this was an auto trader lead. And I've, of course, deleted um, the customer's um, name from the email address, but I left the rest of her email. So her email address was at Robert Half Legal, right? So this part's really important because this, this is the only thing I really have about the customer. Everything else you're seeing is exactly the way the lead came in. So uh, you have Renata, her first name, no last name. We had a work email. We had no phone number for day phone number, no evening phone number, no cell phone number, no fax number. The only thing we had for an address was her zip code. That's it. The buying information, timeline, and everything we had was just this vehicle information. That's all we had. And she had submitted an offer of $19,950 uh, through AutoTrader, which was obviously a discounted offer. So this is the way the lead came in. So with this lead, the only thing we have, the only thing we even look at is the email address is the only clue, other than the fact that we can tell that this person doesn't wanna share information with us. Now here's the mistake most dealerships would traditionally make in normal times. You get a lead in like this, it's got basically no information on it, and the first thing your sales department or BDC agents send is they send an email back and say, hey, when can we hop on a phone call? Well listen, there's three different fields for phone numbers on the lead and she didn't put in anything. What makes you think that she wants to hop on a phone call with you real quick? There's nothing that gives me any indication this person wants to talk on the phone right now. Or, or, or the uh, classic BDC agent will say something like, um, you know, when would be a good time for you to come in and take a look? Well, what is it about this lead that gives you any indication that this person wants to come in and see you at this point? They're giving you basically nothing to work with. So this, this is the equivalent on the lot of a customer who immediately blows you off and tells you just, you know, I'll come get you if I need you. This is not a open up customer. This is a closed off customer. So pattern recognition is going, what, what do I know based on the information? What I know is an email address, is a work email address. And what I know is the customer is unwilling to give me any information. So what I want to do is take that and I wanna create a reverse appointment response. So the reverse re appointment response is customizing a response back to the customer that would cause the customer to open up using psychology. So the first thing we did is I took the roberthalflegal.com and I put it in a URL and I clicked on the website. And what I did was I read about the company. What is Robert Half Legal? Who are they? What do they do? Um, you know, what kind of company is this that she works for? 
I also searched her name in the company to see if I could pull up her job title so I could see what kind of job she has within the company. All that took about a minute and a half for me to do. And then this is the lead that we came up with as a response. So I'm gonna break it down for you in stages. So let's just take a look at it one step at a time. So the second step in the process is pattern interruption. Here's my subject line. Couldn't help myself, but see that you're working at Robert Half Legal. That's my subject line. Then the opening sentence is, Renata, when I saw that your email ends with at Robert Half Legal, I decided to do some research about your company. Now, this is not the way a normal car salesperson would respond to a normal car inquiry. This is called pattern interruption. They don't expect this kind of response. Tailoring my response to the customer, personalizing it, and exposing to the customer what it is that, that I've done on as far as research. Now, here's where the, the step continues. It says, you're working at one of the biggest staffing agencies in the United States, and it was recently recognized as America's best staffing agency. Based on my experience, customers like yourself value time, efficiency, and professionalism. Time, efficiency, and professionalism. So I'm giving a very bullet point, very concise email because she works at a staffing agency and a legal agency, and the kind of people who would work there are very, uh, uh, very, you know, um, uh, organized, very structured. You know, they're more likely to respond well to a very bullet pointed kind of approach, which is what I'm taking here. So that's step three, proactivity, telling her what I think she would want. Then step four is permission. It says here, and you would like to get things done before you come into the dealership and make sure it would be a fast and easy process. I can help and here's how. Now I'm basically offering permission to myself to offer my help. That's step four. Here's step five, the possibilities. It says, I can send you more pictures and videos about this vehicle. It says, I can find another vehicle you might be interested in. I can bring the vehicle to your workplace to save you time, or I can take care of the paperwork prior to your arrival. So giving her options of the possibilities of how she could move forward. Now, the last part I wanna show you, which is kind of a bonus step, step six here, is the call to action. In this case, I created a custom call to action that's super efficient, and here's what it is. It says, please feel free to let me know which one is most important for you. And you can simply put one, two, or three, or four in the subject line. Is this something that would work for you? This is giving her a very simple, easy, efficient, direct and to the point kind of email using all the steps I outlined for you. Well, what's fascinating about this is the response that came back in under a half an hour. And the response was a reverse appointment. Here was the response sent back to the salesman, Tim. Tim, well played. Some of the best customer service I've ever seen. The offer to bring my car to my work is amazingly convenient and I love it. Can you remind me which car it was though? I've looked at several. I'm actually taking a half day today so I may be able to come in. Feel free to text me and here's my number. And then we now have her cell phone number, a request to text, an offer for her to come in. We have her first and last name, and we have her work number, and we have her email address again. We got all of that in an immediate first response from the customer in under 30 minutes from the time we composed our email. This was from a lead that he had been sending emails to and gotten no response for the last couple of days. We send this one, and all of a sudden, we get an instant response. This is called the reverse appointment. Now, beyond the five impressions, the five steps that I just showed you there, we also need to understand the, the principles behind it, the urgency part behind it. This is the psychology of why a customer keeps an appointment at all. So I'm gonna go over this very quickly with you because if your sales team and BDC agents understand this, the psychology, it changes the kinds of voicemails they leave, it changes the kinds of emails they send, and it causes customers to respond quicker. So here are the four principles of urgency that you need to understand. Hope for gain, fear of loss, obligation and reciprocity, and liking and familiarity. Every appointment that has ever showed up at your store, every customer that's ever kept an appointment, on some level did it because of one or a combination of these four things. When your team understands this, then they intentionally incorporate it into their follow-up. And here's what I mean by that. Let's take a look at hope, hope for gain. So hope for gain is approaching the customer by giving them a good reason of something that could happen for them. So hope for gain means things like how, how uh, my vehicle is going to be improved by coming to see you, how my payment might improve, how my credit might improve, or how my situation overall might improve. 
if your sales team and BDC team learns how to speak the language of hope with your leads, what will happen is they'll start to build enough hope in your customers for them to go, I want to come see what you can do because you've given me hope that my situation will improve. So they need to learn the language of hope. That all starts by simply asking questions of your client when you're talking to them. So if I, for example, get you on the phone and I say something like, you know, when you were first putting in this lead, when you were first deciding to shop for a car, what is it you were really hoping would happen? And what were you hoping someone like me could do for you? If your team learns to just ask that question, the customer will open up and tell you what their hope is. If you can talk enough about giving them what they hope they can get, the customer will come in because hope drives behavior. If people don't feel hope, they don't take action. So that's number one. The, the second one is fear of loss, which is what will happen if they don't take action, how they may lose money, how they may lose time, how they may lose the car that they want, how they may lose their minds doing the shopping forever. When you describe to people the consequences of waiting, the consequences of not keeping the appointment, when you can talk to the client and find out what their goal is from a hope side and what they don't want to have happen, you can build a hope for gain, fear of loss, reason for them to come in. And when you talk about, for example, um, you know, what they're hoping to do is they're hoping to take advantage of the per current incentives. And you say, you know, I appreciate that just because um, right now these incentives are only available on certain models. And once those are gone, you'll lose the incentives. And our inventory obviously is changing as people come in and take advantage of the incentives. So if you wait too long, you may not only lose, lose out on the money and the discounts, but you also lose out on the availability of options in my inventory, which means you're gonna be stuck with maybe a package that you don't really want. That's talking from a place of fear of loss. Now, on top of that, you wanna add in obligation reciprocity. Obligation is a principle in psychology that says if you add enough value to somebody, if you create enough uh, unexpected value, the customer will feel like they, they have to reciprocate and give you back value, in this case, for their time. So obligation is what, what you can do for them, or what you do that's unique, or what you'll do right now for them, or what you'll do, uh, or why you'll do it for them. So for example, when a lead comes in, if you're able to give unexpected value, let's say for example, if you say to that lead, hey listen, before I invite you all the way into the, to the dealership, could I do a personal video walk around of the vehicle? Could I show you a personal video tour of the car? That way you have more confidence um, that it's the car that you want. Or if I said, hey, before I have you come in, um, if, if, if you want to, what I can do is I can talk to a couple of my management and make sure that they feel like the, um, the, the type of vehicle and the incentives that you want are gonna be something that's gonna actually be applicable to you because I want you to know that if you come in, the time that you spend here is gonna be valued and respected. If you say that to the customer, they go, wow, you do that, that'd be great. Um, what you want is you want your leads to say, at least in their own mind, but if they can't out loud, you want them to say, wow, you'll do that for me? Wow, no one else offered that. Wow, no one else even um, recommended that. Um, if you can get the customer to feel that two to three times in the way that you communicate, their customer is going to start feeling like, I owe you my time. I owe you the appointment. I owe you to honor that time because of what you've done for me. So when you tell them um, what you're doing, what you tell them what you do that's unique at your store, what you tell them, you know, what I can do for you right now, or why you're going to do it for them. Hey, listen, um, my personal experience is I had bad credit at one point and it took someone uh, taking time to walk me through the process and help me get approved and it's helped change my life. That's why I wanna do it for you. Give the customer a reason why you wanna help them and this creates reciprocity in the mind of the consumer. The last one to talk about is the liking and familiarity. And once again, all four of these are the reasons why someone keeps an appointment to begin with. And liking and familiarity is just a kind of a fancy way of saying rapport and empathy. But basically what you wanna do is make sure you tell the customer what you like about them, how you're similar to them, what they will like about doing business with us, and who they remind you of. And so if you're talking to a lead and you say, you know what, I really like working with customers like you because you seem to really know what you want and you seem to have a really good idea of what you're trying to do. And I'm very similar to you in that way. When I shop and spend a lot of money, I come in very um, 
uh, you know, very determined to get what I want. I do a lot of research like you do. And I think you're going to like that about working with us. We respect your time and we understand that you have done research and you know there's options out there. And in fact, you remind me a lot, like I said, of myself and the way my wife shops for things. So I think we're going to have a great time working together and I'm excited to meet you. If you say something like that to a client, they're going to feel like, wow, these people get me. These people understand where I'm coming from. These people are trying to solve, uh, you know, my problem. They're, they're trying to, um, you know, make sure that they can um, meet my needs where I'm at. These people are relatable to me. These people understand me. And when a client feels those emotions, they go, I want to come meet you. I want to come meet the person on the other end of this phone call. And that's really what the reverse psychology or reverse appointment is all about. It's about causing the customer to want to come in instead of us trying to, you know, basically nag the customer to come in, which is what so many BDC departments have. They have like 47 workflows for one lead in the first week. It's insane. We're focused so much on quantity of actions and behaviors. We don't ask any quality based questions about connecting with these people on the other end of that lead. So let's take a look at this then for follow-up. I'm going to give you three basic rules for follow-up that if again your team implements these rules for follow-up, it'll help them be successful. So the first rule for follow-up is going to be to use pattern interruption in their follow-up. The second rule is to use the four principles. And then the third rule is to be professionally persistent. If you will do those things, you're going to have more success. So when we talk about the pattern interruption, just to recap what that, is, what that means, we're going to use unexpected openers in our emails and in our voicemails. We're going to use unexpected voices, which means I'm not going to always be the same person making the call. A BDC agent should not call the same person 17 times. You should have it rotate through. The BDC person sends the first voicemail. The BDC manager does the second voicemail. The sales manager does the third voicemail. You need to rotate voices into your follow-up. That's why, for example, using, for, for I mentioned earlier, video email, you should have a video from the BDC agent, a video from the BDC manager, a video from a sales manager, a video from the general manager. If you can have these different voices come into the process, that causes people to react differently than just having one person sending them you know, 37 messages. Use unexpected mediums. What do I mean by mediums? Again, I'm talking about the different mediums being video versus GIF versus um, uh, memes versus text versus messenger. Um, all these different methods that I'm referring to, uh, you need to incorporate uh, video follow-up, picture follow-up. You need to use Facebook. You need to use uh, um, uh, Facebook Messenger. You need to use um, you know, email. You need to use chat. You need to use all these different methods to try to communicate with the client and engage them. Um, you know, how often are your people sending out memes to customers? How often are they sending out videos? If you're not combining the medium that they're using and the method that they're using, you're gonna come across as stale and stagnant. The customer's gonna just block you out entirely. So always use different ways of interrupting people's patterns. That's rule number one. Remember the four principles that I just gave you. You wanna use hope for gain, fear of loss, you wanna use reciprocity, and you wanna use liking familiarity. In your voicemails, your scripts for your voicemails should alternate these four different messages. So in one voicemail, it's, hey, listen, the reason I'm calling you is because I know you were really hoping to get into a nice newer vehicle. You're hoping to get something that would lower your payments or even lower your interest rate. And you were hoping that you could work with somebody who could make it easy. The reason I'm calling you is because I believe that we can do all those for you and everything you're hoping for can happen. That's one voicemail. Another voicemail is fear of loss. Hey, listen, the reason I'm calling you today was because I know that you didn't want to miss out on getting a vehicle that could be more affordable. I know you don't want the interest rates to go up and cause your payment to go up. And I, don't, I know you don't want to be stuck in a car that you, um, that you ultimately know won't work for you or not be able to get the car that you want because someone buys it out from under you. I just want to make sure that you know that uh, if you're you know, wanting to take action and not miss out on things, we're here for you. That's a fear of loss voicemail. The third voicemail is reciprocity. Hey, I'm following up with you. There's a few things that I've been doing um, in preparation for meeting with you. I've already been talking to my management and uh, on behalf of you uh, for some of the financing and programs. I've also, I recorded a couple of videos that I want to send to you as well. One is a video of my inventory availability. And the other one is a quick video from my finance manager who I talked to you about what you're trying to do. And so there's reciprocity because I'm letting the customer know in the voicemail, these are all the things I'm doing for you and I'm going to send them over to you next. And then the liking and familiarity voicemail. Hey, I'm uh, following up with you just to let you know, 
Uh, you're going to really enjoy working with us. I'm sure you're stressed out right now. I'm sure you have a whole bunch of things on your mind, but working with us is really simple and here's why. And tell them what they will enjoy about working with you. You need to have your team needs to understand that if your email correspondence and your voicemail correspondence does not specifically touch on at least one of these four or a combination of them, you are just whistling in the wind. You're just barking at the fence. There's no value in just doing tasks for the sake of tasks. We need to do tasks that create results. And the only way to do that is to activate the customer psychology. So professional per persistence is basically just um, how to make sure that your sales team and your BDC agents know how to follow up in a way that doesn't create conflict or stress. The way that I encourage you to do that is to use what's called the permission not to call technique. This is a very specific word track that your team should use. And it goes like this. It says, listen, I know you're busy. So please don't feel like you have to call me back right away. If I don't hear from you, I'll keep you on my call list and I'll follow up with you later today. No need for you to call me. I'll keep you on my list and I'll follow up with you. But when you have some time, feel free to call. That's called the permission not to call technique. When you tell people, look, you don't have to call me. I'm going to keep calling you and keep you on my list, but you stay doing what you do and I'll touch base with you later. When you give permission, permission for people not to call you and then they don't call you, then you also said that you'd call them. So then you call them. What happens is it creates in the mind of the customer. This person keeps telling me that I don't have to call them and they're going to call me and then they keep calling me. So maybe I should call them if I don't want them to call me. It'll actually cause customers to call you back quicker, like a reverse psychology. The next one is the commitment to you statement. When you're talking to their client, tell them what your commitment is to them. Say, here's my commitment to you. Here's what you can count on me for. Here's my promise to you. Make sure they understand um, why you are going to stay in touch with them. Also, make sure that you let them know that you've got them on a hot list so that they understand that they are a priority and that you're going to continue to follow up. And of course, the last one is to let them know that you haven't forgotten. So when you put all this together, it sounds something like this. Hey, listen, the reason for my call is because I know you're really hoping to get into a nicer newer vehicle. You're hoping to find a vehicle that could maybe even lower your payments or your rates. And that's why I'm following up because I believe we can do all those things you're hoping for. So, but listen, uh, I know you're busy. Don't feel like you have to call me back right now. Um, I'm going to keep you on my hot list. I'm committed to following up with you because I know this is important to you. And I want to make sure that you know that I haven't forgotten you. So if you want to call me back, here's my number, but don't worry, I'll call you if I don't hear from you. That's the voicemail. And when you put all those pieces together, it causes customers to call you back and it causes customers to feel compelled to call you back because they feel like, how do I keep saying, uh, I'm going to blow this person off when they're being so nice, when they're talking about what's important to me, when they keep telling me I'm important to them, it's really hard to keep blowing the person off. So those are the three rules for professional persistence. Now there's two options that we have when it comes to this whole approach. Option number one is to make it about us. We could do that, that's really easy. Um, hey, listen, I'm calling you because I haven't heard from you. I was just wondering if you're still gonna buy a car. Uh, did you, you know, I've been calling you now, I've left a few voicemails. I'm just calling to see if you still want me to keep calling you, right? It's, it's like making it about us or we can of course make it about the customer. If we make it about us, we're gonna focus on your process, right? Hey, this is, this is my process and we're going to focus on your profit. We're going to focus on your time. We're going to focus on your effort. Salespeople do this all the time. BDC agents do this all the time. Uh, they say things like, I don't want to keep wasting my time or yours by calling you. What does that even mean? I don't want to keep wasting my time. Who cares? You're making it about yourself, brother. Don't do that. So if you make it about your process, your profit, your time, and your effort, if you make it about us and what we're trying to get done, the customer's not engaged. But if you make it about them, then their customer is going to be engaged. Focus on the person you're serving, focus on their problem, focus on their time, and focus on creating their experience, and customers will respond. They want to work with somebody who gets them, who understands them, and who's making it about them. So in closing, I'm on a mission, and my simple mission is to save the world one salesperson at a time by helping my clients out experience their competition and create raving fan advocates. That's what I'm focused on and that's what I'm all about. If you like what I'm showing you, I'm gonna open it up for some Q&A here, but if you like what I'm showing you and you want some more information, you can take a picture of that and you can go to any of those sites there to learn more about me um, and to get more information from, uh, from my company. So take a picture of that if you have your smartphone and now I'm gonna open it up
for some questions. So I think the chat room is still open. So let me hit the uh, stop share and let me open up the chat room and then we'll get into some questions right now. <laughs> 